Hello, everybody. That was very, very kind of you to come down to the front, because we were worried we might suffer from terminal loneliness before we'd even had a first bit of a <laughs> chat. So, um, yeah, who's starting this, you or me? No, we're, we're, we're supposed to be in conversation about activism, youth, the loss of youth, all of those things. But actually, what's really interesting, I, I, I was talking to Lucy in, the, in the, um, um, the green and yellow room back over there, and she was telling me the story of Reserva. And I don't think you said that. You didn't talk about this morning, did you, how no. you set all that up? Could you tell everybody the, the rather sad and bittersweet yeah. and then marvellous and joyous arriving of a Reserva? Of course. So um, my friend Callie, who is the founder of Reserva, um, she, for eight years, worked as a designer at Nat Geo Kids in Washington, D.C. Um, and so she was always interested in, in conservation and the education aspect. Um, and very sadly, her younger sister got diagnosed with terminal cancer. Um, and, yeah, Callie lost her sister a few years ago. Um, but in her last few months, her sister Finley set up a fund to raise money for... Um, conservation causes and she raised tens of thousands of, of dollars and that really was the inspiration for Reserva. Callie wanted to, cal to, to carry her sister's legacy on um, and it was Bella Lack who some of you may have heard speak earlier on um, who Callie first spoke to with this idea and said look do you think it's something that's going to work it's never been done before. Um, she'd spoken to colleagues about the idea, and they were, you know, they weren't sure because it was so ambitious. Um, but she she pushed ahead and got a small team of young people together to really spearhead it and get the movement going. Um, and I was in with with that early group, and now we're here three years down the line, having created the world's first youth-funded nature reserve and you know, so much support from so many different organisations and an incredible international network of young people. So it's... Oh, that's brilliant. I mean, one of the things that I was really enjoying about the conversation outside was you were saying that how lonely it felt feeling all these things being on your own and that the project is actually a bit of a drawing the lightning and everybody suddenly has a role and a meaning and they, they've got a, a reason to do stuff. Is that, would you say that's the main, the main thrill of it? Yeah, I think being able to actually have, have an impact because this, yeah, it, it's so overwhelming being one, one person. And I said to you, you know, it was quite isolating in a way, not in a bad way for, for me personally, but growing up being interested in nature because it wasn't the norm. It was just me and, oh, I loved bugs, and, but nobody else did. And... I wanted to do something to help it, but there was only so much I could do as one person. And being part of this network has meant, you know, we've, we've created events, we've created campaigns together, bringing all of our different skills and interests, whether that's science or music or art or filmmaking, you name it, and we've put it to use. And it's just, and it's, it's motivating as well. You know, working with Bella is, is super motivating and it, it just keeps you going and, and keeps you feeling hopeful and like you can push forward and make a difference. Yeah, no, no, very, very impressive. I, I, I was in um, Glasgow last November and, and the, for, for COP and there were, there were a whole range of young activists and it was really interesting to see these middle-aged people wanting to be pictured with these youngsters. <laughs> It's really a sad git sort of thing, you know, the, all these politicians, oh, there's, there's, there's a young Belgian woman, she speaks well, and all this and stuff. And what was actually brilliant was that, that I went to the talk with um, Christiana Figueres and Nicola Sturgeon, and they'd got some, they'd got some young activists there. Boy, did Nicola Sturgeon regret that. <laughs> because she was expecting them all to behave themselves and be jolly grateful to be on the stage with her. And she said, she, it, was a, it was a wonderful moment. If you, I don't know whether you ever saw it on telly. It was a wonderful, sorry, I'm a bit rude. Um, it was a wonderful moment where, where Nicola Sturgeon said, and what do you think? And the girl just looked, I can't remember, she's from Belgium, very articulate. And she said, I was just thinking, what kind of asshole says something like this on a public stage and has just given permission for drilling to shell in the North, North Sea? 
And it was really amazing. It was amazing. But I have to say, my, my estimation of Nicola Sturgeon went up quite significantly because she didn't duck it. She said, yes, I am an asshole. And oh, well, she didn't use that word. She said, I, I am a hypocrite. And she said, I hope that when you get to be in my shoes and doing this stuff, you realize there are times you have to be a hypocrite in order to make the balance. I thought that was quite brave to say that in that way. It was a really good, mm. really good discussion. But the thing, this morning when we were talking, yeah. we were talking about young activists, it's a bit like a cult thing, isn't it? It's, How it, do you feel being a cult? It's weird. I mean, I, I, yeah, I, exactly. That is, that is what it is. I find it strange that people, even people in my own family, they look at me and they say, you're so inspiring. Oh, no. And... Over and cornflakes. I, Ooh. I just... There's, you know, it's, it's nice that a lot of people do see us as inspiring and, you know, hopefully we can inspire them to, to take action. But I, I think that kind of what it, it is what it is. It's kind of passing the baton. It's like, oh, you're doing all this amazing work. And it's, it's all well and good, you know, commending us for what we're doing. But a lot of people will say that. But but they won't take action themselves. And, and it, it's just strange, and it's a lot of responsibility almost, kind of a lot of, of pressure, I think, for some, for some people. Um, it's like all eyes are on you, and, and what you do is amazing. When, when really, you know, I just happened to fall in love with wildlife when I was a kid and then realized that it was in trouble, and I couldn't ignore that. I had to do something about it. Um, and I do wonder how different you know my my teenage years and early 20s would have looked and and those of my colleagues at reserva you know if if there wasn't an ecological crisis i don't mm. want it to sound too downbeat but you know this it, even though it does bring great opportunities and it's amazing to to be doing something for the greater good um it's it's also a big responsibility, I think. Do you think middle-aged old farts see you like the fire brigade? Do, do you think they think, oh, thank heavens, there's some youngsters can do this now? I don't... I mean, facetious, obviously. But. I mean, I think there, there is a lot of finger-pointing sometimes where younger people maybe say, or, or paint a picture of, oh, you know, older, older generations are doing nothing at all, which, which isn't true. There are lots of people doing brilliant things of all ages. Um, and I think there is, uh, there's a need for us to kind of work together. It can be, it can be quite polarizing, I think. You know, it's young people versus everyone else. It shouldn't really be like that. We should all be talking, we should all be working together um, to, to, to find solutions and, and share ideas. Do you find, a, a serious question, do you mm. find people of your contemporaries less materialistic than you think the generation above you in age is? Not, not necessarily. I, I don't, it's, it's hard to say. I, I've had a lot of people say to me, oh, but you should feel hopeful because your generation are so much more switched on. They're so much, they, they're, they're taking action. But I do live in an echo chamber. You know, the people that I follow on social media, the people I work with, they're all, people that are interested in conservation and do care about nature so it's hard to say I think people outside of that space I wouldn't necessarily say they're less no. le less so do you think you should join the conservative party <laughs> no um, no 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 I was actually not joking <laughs> no, I, from the point of view that you know can you create um, the atmosphere from within mm. you're talking about echo chambers I often mm. wonder about echo chambers how um, I mean, they are there. I mean, the really interesting thing is when you look at yourself. Um, at Eden, we have a regular thing where we try and hunt the prejudice. Mm. And it's shocking how deep your own prejudice is about so many things. And you will not hear the good of someone on the other side, you know, for, uh, under any circumstances. And it's really interesting that we won't be honest about that. I think it's quite interesting. I'm, are you allowed to be political here? I, I find it quite... Fuck it, I will be. That if 
One of the interesting things I thought about Donald Trump was because he was such a caricature at the same time. So he says really loud, bad things that if you're liberal, you can get angry about and you can be really self-righteous, such as we'll build a wall to stop Mexicans getting in or whoever getting in, they'll do that. So everybody's out in outrage. But then the thing that we don't, the liberals don't talk about is um, the Democrats have been talking about doing something for about 12 years and they just haven't done anything. And the truth is that an awful lot of people who want to have the higher ground keep the higher ground by not being active about it at all so they can talk about it around a table. That's the only reason I was wondering whether you could actually put the fox in the hen house, so to speak, by joining the Conservative Party. I think that'd be quite interesting. Maybe. Um, I'll pay you membership fee. Well, the, but I do. I, I was thinking the other day, actually, kind of like the political space isn't really something that I have thought about being a part of but there is there is a need for you know people from outside to, to come in and shift people's perspectives but whether that happens soon or not well I if know. i said to you that we've got the lowest biodiversity of any country in europe mm. which we do yeah. i'm sorry i'm pretending okay. to be english now <laughs> we're in spain but but um at what point do you think it's important enough to get really really angry Oh, it's it's a hard question to answer. I think it's I wouldn't say, describe myself as kind of a very angry activist. Um, I hate the label activist, but just because of the connotations it kind mm. of has at, at the moment. Bella and I spoke about the need to kind of rebrand it, but um, you know, people that. That, that do get angry, but I do think it's it's justified. I do think there needs to maybe be another layer of of kind of that's important work raising awareness, but then also taking action as well in terms of direct conservation. It's it's a tricky question to answer. Um, I don't know when I would. You know, I, start. it's unfortunate you just happen to be sitting here. <laughs> I mean, you know, well, unfortunately, it's my good fortune, but I think. The thing is about anger, which is really interesting. A great dinner party conversation, if you really want to get all your friends really riled, is, um, I mean, is, is if you knew that there were only three whales left in the world, if you knew that, right, speculative, and you are in a port of some fictional nation and whaling boats that have permission of the state to go out are going to kill the last three whaling boats, at what point do you think it is morally justified, or is it not morally justified, to risk other humans? I mean, we have got seven or eight billion of us, so we can spare a few, but... Uh, no, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? At what point is it okay to be active in terms of protecting something? I mean, maybe the older farts should be thinking about that in the room, because we've had a good life. But at what point do you actually allow your anger to go to a point of being genuinely active because it's really interesting how so many people john elkington was very honest about this that the reason people like him and people like me often have a platform is because people who are less good tempered than us throw a brick through a window of mcdonald's which then make people interested in finding out what our views are mm. which is the most extraordinary thing mm. so you know if you want to throw a brick through mcdonald's you're keeping us really employed but no i'd, I'd be very interested in your views when we come to talking to you because it, i think it's quite interesting yeah. to have a Group I think I, I've, I've heard people criticise it, you know, throwing bricks through windows in the name of conservation but um, and climate change. But when you do, you know, I have those moments where I just feel so devastated and so kind of, what are we doing? You know, yeah. and, and it's in those moments that I understand the frustration, even though I'm, I'm not one of those people that, that would go out and do that. You know, I understand why people do, and and it is. It's just that. Please listen. You know, this is all of our futures, and we need to do something about it. It's that desperation, I think. So, if we, a lot of people think that there may be. I mean, it's popular language, but a lot of people say, don't they, that there's 60 harvests left. That's a, 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 a sort of sentiment that's been expressed by various scientists in in, in Europe. So that's not many years, is it, until there's no harvest left. So at what point, as lemmings, do we head towards... I find that really interesting when people talk about five-year plans or ten-year plans. There's, 
When I look at the modern crop of politicians, I don't see, I don't see the sort of people who I would put my trust in. Do you trust the people you look at? No, I mean, there was some, a point made earlier about how people in power just don't understand these issues. They're not scientists, you know, that, and, and a lot of them are unwilling to listen to, to the science. And I think, yeah, that, that's, that's worrying. Um, yeah, it's, it's, like I say, we, we need more, a greater diversity of people in all, in all spaces, including in, in politics. But how do you make that an appealing space? Because it is so kind of insular as it is and closed off, I think. Yeah, well, there are those who think that you should just have a picture of a kitten and say, if you don't mm. change, the kitten gets it. What do you think? Yeah, good work. Yeah. It's worth a try. It's worth a try. Anything, <laughs> anything um, right now. I think it'd be really interesting because I, I, I recognize some faces in the audience as people who are kind of in the activist sort of area. Has anyone got a really good crack, a good view on the world about how we could have our hero here um, represent us even better? Do you think it is a protest thing? Do you think it's a brand thing? Do you think, what do people think? Uh, it, please, if you've got a voice, as opposed to doing all that microphone stuff, is there a microphone? Because, no, because, but you've got to be fit, okay? Or else we have those horribly boring moments while we wait for someone to stumble amongst the seats and break their ankle, and then it's a tough question. Has anybody got any views as to how our superhero, the Ronaldo of the environment movement, could create a platform that is actually reaching a lot of people? While they're, th while they're thinking and not being shy, um, media. Mm. I know you had a year's media training and media working in the media, yeah. and it didn't, you didn't like it. I didn't like the, the, the degree. I, I have my, my work is, is in media, and I, it's nice. I like how you know, it can reach new people, and you can get a message out to new people, and, and it allows that creativity. Um, but it's, we were talking earlier about social media. In, in particular, and how accessible it is to, to certain certain generations, and again, it's that echo chamber thing. Um, there's uh, what what I've enjoyed over the last few years is is being involved in kind of more independent projects. When I was younger, I thought I'm going to go and work at the BBC Natural History Unit, which I don't know, I may well end up doing in in a few years' time, but. Being kind of outside of that, working on independent projects, being able to push conservation messages a bit more, serious messages, and, and use it to raise funds for conservation organizations and things like that, I've found really valuable. Um, yeah. We were talking about water bear mm. earlier. I, I don't know how many of you have heard of water bear, but they're basically well they've set themselves up to be the Netflix of environmental films that's a bad lumpy expression but the idea was that they wanted to harvest all environmental films to come into under the water bear arm and that was going to be a really big commercial idea and the lady who set up Discovery I think set that up and it's based out of Amsterdam but it hasn't been the success that everybody or they thought it was going to be and the reason seems to be when you talk to people that actually people are pretty bored of films, wildlife films that are the norm, and when you've got the BBC doing those big ones, you've left with... You had My Octopus Teacher, for example, which a lot of people loved, but most of the films are pretty vapid if the only cause is just the protection of wildlife. Um, so obviously just making films ain't the thing. No. I, I think there's so much more appetite now for people. people don't want to see problems and no solutions. They want to know what they can do. Um, I watched a, a, a panel discussion a few weeks ago about how, about making these sorts of programs for younger kids. And the people there were saying it's, it's so much easier to broach bigger, more complex conservation topics, environmental messages to, to younger people because they're just more open-minded, whereas I think maybe we've, we've grown used to seeing nature programs in a certain way, and I, I think people do get overwhelmed when it's, 
when they're kind of so many statistics are thrown at them and and facts about biodiversity loss and they see these images um and yeah they we need solutions as well yeah. and it's a whole different layer a whole additional layer and i don't think i don't think a lot of us quite know what the solutions are you know it's just it's just not clear cut that's the thing is we were talking about visions of the future i don't know what what i envision the future to be um i don't know what what's going to solve all of these complex issues because it is so complex everything's um so intertwined and and so yeah i i don't know it's it's hard to tackle those issues with with video people are trying to do it hopefully it does become have you heard of the carbon cowboy i haven't no peter bick is it Uh, you'd love to ask us a question. Okay, okay well, we'll, 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 we'll come to, we'll, would, you, would you like us to come to you right now? You look poised, you look absolutely in the stock. Ready? On your marks, get set, go, have a question. Uh, it's an intergenerational story, really, I suppose. So Extinction Rebellion in London, I think the first uh, big rebellion that they did. So the story is, and I, I think you can find it on YouTube, it, it was filmed, is that the... Um, People from Extinction Rebellion were blocking one of the major bridges, Westminster Bridge, which is just next to the House of Parliament, and the police decided to remove them. So the police went up and said, uh, we're going to arrest you. You know, move, they were all linking arms, move or we'll arrest you. Before they had time to arrest them, a group who Extinction Rebellion call the Grey Panthers, who are more my age than Lucy's age, um, stood between the line of people linking arms behind and the police. And they said, don't arrest them, arrest us. And the police walked away. Because 80% of the Metropolitan Police in London actually understand climate change. They understand what they need to do, and they're not particularly keen to arrest pensioners, etc. So I think that's, that's, that's one story which I think is encouraging and intergenerational. Mm -hmm. And I guess um, the other thing that, that, that I haven't heard a lot today is about corporates. And another story about the war in Ukraine, which is sort of, it's tangential but relevant, is at the beginning, one of the peacemakers um, was saying, what you need to do is you need to find people who are working for the companies and reach out to them and say, we, we still like... Russians or whatever. So there are a lot of people working in corporates, and corporates carry on. Politicians change the whole thing. <coughs> so we're always dealing with a new minister and a new policy and a change of government, etc. But if you actually reach out to the people who are working for Shell or working for BP or working for uh, any of the major pharma companies or, or the chemical companies that are doing a lot to destroy our planet, they're not necessarily bad people, but the pressure from the people who are employed by them could be a way. And surely there are a lot of young people who are employed and there are a lot of you know, older people who are employed. One sort of way, if you could do the social media reach to people who are employed and get them to question their, their bosses. Thought for the day. Thank you for that thought. That's great. That's really good. Thank you. The Carbon Cowboys. For those of you who laugh when I talk about the Carbon <laughs> Cowboys, this is the joke is at your expense. Look them up on YouTube. Millions of views. Millions. Anyway, Peter Bick, who started the Carbon Cowboys, they're filmmakers from the University of Arizona. He has just spent 10 years making the most extraordinary film. And the reason it's taken so long is because he was fed up with people talking about um, uh, 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 regenerative agriculture as if it was some kind of hippie shit. So he persuaded uh, 20 top scientists to join him on this journey. And what the Carbon Cowboys have done in this film, which is called um, Roots So Deep, we held the, the premiere was held at my gardens at, at Heligan. But simply because Peter Bick, who's a friend of John Elkington's, came to stay because I'd watched his movies. And when he came to England, I said, please, I'd love to meet you. And he said, I've got the first of my four part thing in my computer, would you like to see it? And I said, whoa, and I phoned half of my colleagues at Eden and Elegant, they came over and we had a party. 
I tell you, it was absolutely astonishing. The last three minutes of the first episode, I felt like I'd had a moment of utter revelation. May I describe the last three minutes? The, the deal is these four films are two farms are partnered up. One is traditional, one is regenerational, right, regenerative, across America. And they, the farms are next to each other geographically, so they compare. Anyway, in this particular one, they were in uh, southern Virginia, I think it was. And there's this old guy who's farming a traditional farm. And the last part of the movie goes like this. He's looking straight into the camera, and he says, I could show you use me a bird dog. And then there's a 90-second gap. You're dying with tension. He goes, but I guess it ain't worth it because there ain't no quail. And there's another 40-second gap. He said, I guess that's because there's no insects. And then Peter Bick, who's the director, asks him, he said, um, would you like to meet your neighbor? He said, that'd be fine, that'd be fine. Cut. We're now on the veranda of the regenerative farm. Right? You're expecting lots of conversation, team, aren't you? It is deafening. It's flipping quail. It's just deafening with quail in this farm. And the guy, the, the traditional farmer is going, Still says nothing. The tradition, the regenerative farmer just looks up, and this is the end of the first movie. He says, "Would y'all like some help?" And the other guy goes, "I've been mighty obliged." And I'm not going to tell you what happens in the next three. The film is being released in in, in the autumn. But I tell you what, it, make, it makes you very misty-eyed, and it made me misty-eyed because plonkers like me talk about carbon and what we're going to do with corporates and what we're going to, you know, all, that, all the sort of like percentages of this and diddly squats of that. And there I was watching two farmers and it turns out that the guy that I thought was on my side, the regenerative farmer, he also doesn't believe in climate change. <laughs> no, no, he doesn't believe in climate change but he believes in bird life and he believes in insects and he believes in fertile soil and he, he believes in everything that everybody in this room believes. And we don't care, do we? Because he believes in that. The things that we would like to have happen would happen anyway. So why do we start a war? But this thing about quail was so interesting that the issue of quail for this guy was he was betraying his grandfather and his great-grandfather that the land was no longer sustaining that which had made it the old home. And I just wonder whether... Uh, sorry, this is a very long-winded way of introducing the idea about storytelling. Mm. Because to be quite honest, if I hear some other white bloke telling me about, you know, we're at 422 parts per million and we're doomed, and then they tell me I need to plant bloody trees, you know, I wouldn't mind if they understood trees, okay? I understand trees. But so much of the stuff that is talked is kind of like Chelsea Posh. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's like I've got all my arguments so I can actually be really well informed about climate change. And actually, Getting people to do stuff without even mentioning climate change, I think, could do a heck of a lot of good. So how do you fancy not being interested in climate change? But, no, but, mean, but you're a zoologist, aren't well, you? Well, exactly. This is the thing. I think, oh, I'm kind of under this umbrella of like, oh, a young person who's, who cares about the environment. They must be a climate activist. I'm really not. You know, I, I don't know all the stats about climate change. I, I don't... I'm, I'm not... I don't see myself in that space, you know. I see myself in the in the space of biodiversity conservation, mm. um, and it's interesting how we all kind of get lumped together. When I do think there's value in kind of focusing on your own little piece of the puzzle because you can really hone in then and and um, yeah, make sure you're, you're having an impact and and not talking rubbish. <laughs> I guess. Um, yeah, we're all. It's funny how we're all, all branded under the same same. Because most, most, people, most people care about wildlife, don't they? I mean, yeah. I mean the worst thing is, is I blame red tractors. To be honest, red tractors were a mistake. Have you ever looked at children's books that are available to you? 
It's amazing how sinister, it's like a communist takeover. When you go into a bookstore for children, there's always a friendly cockerel. Does he know what's happening? Does he hell? There's always a cow that's never got cystitis. There's always a red tractor, you know, with it, and it's always perfectly red. Because farms are lovely, healthy places, and yet they're not. God, are they evil. They're so evil, so many farms. I, most of my friends are farmers, so I've got to be careful, but um, I'm, very in, I'm very interested in this stuff, the zoologist's approach to farming. I think climate change might be the mistake that we're talking about climate change. Mm. They were actually, it's about light, it's, it's, it's existence. It, yeah, it's about e restoring ecosystems and, and stability. And it's the whole tree planting thing drives me insane Nuts. because, because yeah, people think plant a tree, it captures carbon, job done. It doesn't work like that. You know, we need to in restore entire ecosystems, restore the, mm. the, the carbon cycle, you know, all of these things that are, that are shaping the landscape. And, um, yeah, it's, it's never, it's never that, that simple as just plant a tree. Um, and, and it's interesting you talk about farming, the amount of people that drive through the countryside and say, oh, it's beautiful, so green, so natural. And it's not, it's a monoculture. And it's, that's that shifting baseline thing. That's the perfect example of, of that. People think that that is nature, the countryside is nature, when it, mm. it isn't. That's not how it should be. Um, yeah. No, I, I, I did something which my father, when he, he died shortly afterwards, not as a result, I guess <laughs> that, but, but I bought a golf course. You'd never think that an environmentalist would buy a golf course, would you? It, I actually, half of it is now not a golf course, it's a most beautiful orchard. And the other part of it is now a nine hole golf course, because I set out, I thought, where could you make a big environmental difference? I thought, a flipping golf course. They're such poisonous places. So I was just asked by somebody, what are you doing? I said, we're going to create the most sustainable golf course in the world. Golf Monthly then immediately got on to me and said, so can we do an article? And then over the, the, over the whole world last month, it said, is this the future of golf? And it's my tiny little golf course. <laughs> basically, we have rough, if for those of you who don't know about golf, it's basically you hit a little white ball. That I'm not very fond of the game, but you hit a little white ball and from one, one place and you try and get it in a hole at the other. But along the way, there's bits of land that, that, that will capture your ball and make you cross because you didn't hit it straight or right with tough a bend. So we've let the, the grass go really, really long. Our roughs are not so much roughs as jungle. And if you, but we've got this great deal that if you get a ball in the rough, which they all do, and lose it, you're not allowed to go in. It's too dangerous. There are snakes. But we give you a free ball to drop on the fairway um, so that you don't go into the rough. And it's bloody funny, because all of these golfers who didn't give a toss about the environment are now going around mid Cornwall saying, we're members of that golf course, the most sustainable one in the world, you know. They, they've even got badger sets. There's no other golf courses with badger sets. They kill badgers pretty sharpish. You know the cure for badgers? Lion shit. We buy a lot of lion shit and we put it around the greens and the badgers go hunting something else. They think, don't want to mess around with them lions. You know, <laughs> that's true. So, so the reason I tell you this story is that because you've gone and bought yourself a, well not yourself, your team, uh, a, a reserve mm. in um, Ecuador. Ecuador, yeah. I'm just, no, which is great. Ecuador's really good, but I was thinking maybe Birmingham. I, I would that, love to do, for us to do something in the UK, yeah, that, that's, you know, this is, British wildlife is, is what, yeah. what first got me interested, and like you say, it's in a, it's in a, bad, a bad way, um, and, yeah, I think, I think um, having a, th there's a lot of, sort of glamorization of, of tropical ecosystems, and, yeah. Our, our back gardens, the wildlife in our back gardens is, is in as much trouble uh, as, as those sorts of places. Probably more. More, yeah. So we should have a reserve in Birmingham, Emmy. <laughs> I could see it, yeah. No, but wouldn't it be great to have a, pr a proper youth-led youth reserve in Birmingham? I say Birmingham because it's the centre of the universe. Well, that's what she tells me. <laughs> Yeah, so I've lost my thread. I've just gone fantasizing about Birmingham and um, reserves. Do you fancy one, actually? 
Do you fancy one? A reserve in yeah, in Birmingham? Yeah, yeah for sure. I reckon you really. I reckon it'd be really. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and there are so many amazing young conservationists in the UK who would also be would also love that. Well, let's hear it here first. Let's go and build one in Birmingham. <laughs> yeah. Woo yeah, we'll do that. We're going to do that. <laughs> We're going to find it. We'll, we'll, we'll start with the farm. Mm -hmm. We start with the farm, and then we start with the, put another farm. And then we find people to buy the farms, and it'd be great. We we'll take the kids out from Birmingham. A bit of slave labour. I, I couldn't help it spoil it immediately. Um, yeah, I've got nothing else to say now. How, how long are we meant to be speaking for? Another six. Have you got a question? Can, oh yeah. So it yeah. So it might be the kind of downer question to what you just said. So when you were saying maybe we don't talk about climate change because we can just do so much just based on people's love for the environment. Um, but that is the argument that's going to be used by the far right uh, in an increasingly eco-fascist world, right, will be protection of the environment. So, you know, I love nature because I hunt or I shoot or I fish or I do whatever it is that I do or I play golf on the world's most sustainable golf course. Um, so I'm, I'm totally part of this movement. But you know what's really, really bad for the nature that I love? Migrants, people. Immigration, that, and that's the argument you can start hearing. If you listen out for it now, in the Republican right in the US, suddenly their nature-loving credentials are very to the fore, and they don't want to talk about climate change. So I just want to, like, and maybe this is a conversation that I think will get picked up in the, in the next conversation. But actually, how do you, you know, if, if, if we don't talk about climate change, and aren't we, we're allowing a certain kind of, my view of how I want to protect nature uh, sometimes comes with some pretty unsavory um, other views. And don't we want to challenge those? Uh, yes, we do. But one of the problems of us liberals is we mess up every argument we make. We cannot help it. And another thing, we're like Old Testament prophets. We've got to do this, we've got to do that, we've got to do that. I spent some time in the company of a guy called Sadhguru, who is um, spelled S-A-D-H, a marvelous man, got 30 million followers, and it was him, me, and George Monbiot, and he tore into George, because George said, I agree with everything you're saying. What, what Sadhguru is saying, you need to get everybody to agree on one thing, and that one thing is to make all farmland in the world 4% vegetable material. Just if you save the soil, that's the most important thing to do. And George said, yes, that's fantastic. And, and, and we, what we need also is to make sure that everybody's farming in this particular way and that we have this and we have that. And then Sadhguru just got up, he said, George, George, have you looked in the mirror recently? <laughs> he said, when you look in the mirror, do you see a man that wants to have the whole world think that he wants to change the world? Or are you a man who's going to change the world? And that's part of the problem with all of us, all of us, we've all got this problem and another thing. I, I, I was very persuaded by Sadhguru because I realized, I realized part of the problem is that we are too clever. If we just said, let's put all the farmland into good health, the elation we would all feel at having a big achievement would then enable another little point to be brought up. But if we did soil and clean water and clean air, but they were the headline points into the universe, I th I've, I've really changed my views. I, I, I've been saying at Eden recently, you know what, we've got to make this a lot simpler. I agree with what you say, but I can't run my life, and you can't either, nor should you, in terms of the fear of what other people might say. But one could start with the perspective is that if you never lose your temper and you're never rude to anybody and exquisitely polite, almost anything is possible. I have never changed my opinion when anyone has shouted at me, ever except when they were wielding a baseball bat, but, you know, <laughs> now, I'm, being, I'm being slightly facetious, but, but I think it's true, these are really important times where you can seize the higher ground by being like, like Lucy is. I just want to save all the little critters. <laughs> no, but it's, it's honest, and people yeah. can actually get around that. You're not a firebrand, I just, I, you know, someone's got to hear it. Let's hear it for the dormice. Let's hear it for the fox. And actually, that thing builds up, and it builds up, and actually, you've got to have the whole system working. That's why Birmingham is going to become really important. It's going to happen. Sorry, I didn't mean to have a rant. <laughs> I, I rant this is your show. This is, I'm your nightmare guest. <laughs> <laughs>
yes, I just want to... I just want to make one point. It refers to something a lot earlier, but I've been holding this mic for 22 minutes or so. <laughs> <laughs> and it didn't work for 21 of them. So, um, but I think that our movement, whatever this is, is totally bad at propaganda. We're, we're so yeah. hopeless at it. So the last point you made is very good. And I always keep saying to people, the best is the enemy of the good. This is a phrase I heard a couple of years ago, and I think this is so true of the environmental music movement, of people saying, no, that isn't enough. We've got to do this and this and this and this. And in the end, we're all paralyzed because there's too much to do. So I completely agree about simple objectives. But the other thing I think that we always fail to do is to celebrate what we have so far achieved. We have mm. the biggest movement in human history. It's true. There are more people involved in this movement. Yeah. And every single day of the week, I hear of 10 new organizations, like this one today. I never heard of Reserva before today. I never heard of that chef, Dan. There's so many things going on that none of us know about, and none of us even celebrate. You know, shouldn't we think that's an amazing achievement, that in 10 years, mm. Hundreds of thousands of new organizations are in existence, dedicating their time and intelligence to working on this. We should be saying, Jesus, we're winning. <laughs> you know, mm. there's, there's an American uh, writer, I think her name is Astra Wood, who said, we're always losing until we win. Yeah. So, so we are, we're losing. It looks like we're losing at the moment, but actually we're all busy and something is growing. And sooner or later, we're all going to look around and say, oh, yes, it's all of us. We're all mm. doing this. We're all on the same side. My motto is we're on the same side, but she doesn't like it. No, no. <laughs> so I'm not allowed to put it on Earth Percent T-shirts. <laughs> That's very good, Brian. That's very good. Well, that's a very good way to actually put a full stop to the conversation. We're all on the same side. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank, thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Really, um, thank you. Thank you, you did an amazing job. I think, uh, you know, you've also warmed people up. And now, the next conversation we have, I hope, um, takes us into the hearts and minds of some more great thinkers and creators and people who really understand the role of art in connecting people, in welcoming people, and in allowing people to tell their own stories. So I'm going to invite to the stage Joe Murphy and Joe Robertson, who are the co-founding artistic directors of Good Chance Theatre Company, which was created when they founded a theatre company and built its first temporary space in the Calais jungle. Their subsequent show, The Jungle, was a sellout success in London, New York, and San Francisco, They've done so much more. They've co-created poetry collectives across the UK. They've uh, made an Afghan kite flying festivals and a, a really extraordinary migrating arts festival, The Walk. They are truly the playwrights of hope. And so welcome to you, the Joes. Please come, take the stage. And I'm also inviting up Majid Majid, or Magic Majid, as he is sometimes known. And um, there's a lot to say about Majid to introduce him as well. Majid arrived in the UK as a refugee age five. He's a Somali-British race and climate activist and author. He's a Time magazine rising star. He was the youngest ever mayor of the city of Sheffield. He's a former member of the European Parliament, and he's the co-founder of the Union of Justice, which is a project you'll hear about tomorrow in our climate justice session. There's more, but I want to let you meet Majid through this conversation now. And also, in our drinks afterwards, he will be signing his book, The Art of Disruption, A Manifesto for Real Change. So, welcome, Majid. Thank you. I am handing the stage over in the hope that after there's been some conversation between Jojo and Majid that everybody will get stuck in again. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Cathy. And everybody can hear us, right? right. I'm very honestly quite uh, lucky to be meeting so many wonderful people, but also sharing the stage with two really amazing people that have been doing some amazing work. 
I don't know if you're familiar, but they, as I kind of said, they are theatre makers and artists. And I think some, one of the questions I kind of really was, you say, curious about, like, many people choose different careers in, in life. Some people go into teaching or whatever aspect, but why did you guys choose, you, why did you choose art as your medium, basically? Why was, mm. you could have done anything, but what kind of drew you to, that to is, art? That is true. Yeah. What, yeah, that's a really good question. I, Art's such a good way of carrying a message, importantly. Um, not necessarily clear messages, but ambiguous messages, and mm. often complex messages, because we live in a complex world. I, I'm not sure that we've found a better way than art to communicate that complexity between individuals and between groups yet. There's also a beauty about art. It's, I think, one of the, the great experiences when you watch a piece of art is that you, you calm yourself you, you go into a slightly different mode of thinking and feeling, and that mode, however you describe it, um, I think is going to be really helpful and important for us in the future as to how we fix the future, mm. if it is the future. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I think to expand on that, you know, the, it, it also humanizes in, in a way that, you know, other forms of communication, other forms of expression, other modes of decision-making, of debate and discussion just don't do. You know, if... if you know, politics is a terrible way of talking about some things because it because it it reduces us to often our basest forms. Whereas art places you in the in the shoes of someone else. It places you in the shoes of another community or another place or another world. And and you know, the greatest art makes you see and makes you see the human side of, of any of any issue, however contentious it might be. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, do you know what it's like? It's do you know with climate breakdown, coming back of a pandemic. Like, there's just so much things happening mm. around the world and like yes we, we can have countless summits talking about it we can write countless like policies about it but when you kind of break down the kind of bones you, you really can't legislate compassion you can't mm. legislate empathy you can't do and I think that's where really art comes in and artists come in and they're like well we then kind of look to you guys to be like well no there's there's other ways of we can of doing things because I guess it's that kind of shared notion of we, basically. Mm. So it's, but yeah, no, it's... I mean, it's, it's, it's really interesting, of course, you know, art doesn't sort of tend to bother itself with legislation, these mm. sort of concrete things that mm. we assume are the ways, the mechanisms of achieving progress, but it does do something that is, um, that pieces of legislation or other things don't do, which is that it, it's, it's quite confident in being, as I said before, ambiguous, not presenting itself as the final thing, the, the answer. And, you know, this, I think, links a little bit into what um, Tim was saying earlier. And there's an important thing, I think, when you experience a piece of art, that you, your, your ego is often not part of it. When it's good, when it's good art, mm -hmm. it takes you out of yourself to put you into the, the, the self of another or many others. And for a whole number of reasons, main one being, I think, social media. Um, I think we're not very good at getting out of ourselves at the moment. And so if I think about why I feel art is going to be so important, it's actually the literal way to encourage empathy. Mm. Mm. I mean, you're the only parliamentarian on this panel, you know, for, yeah. you know you're the only former... <laughs> we, just, we slightly just dissed politics yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah, 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 but you're the only legislator with, with experience. You know, you're a member of the European Parliament. I mean, you saw decisions being made and discussed and debated at the highest possible level. Mm. Like, do you, you know, in this, in this conversation between art and, and other forms, like, what, what, what was that experience, what did that experience reveal to you about how... how how difficult it was to see the human sides of it. I mean, yeah. Mm. Do you know, just one kind of point that came to mind when you were speaking was it's... Sadly, it's always when, I guess, cuts are being made, it's always the arts that kind of get cut the most kind of thing. And I kind of was really thinking about the other day, the other day why is it that we always target the arts as we see it deem not important? And you also kind of see it across the world when it's like, majority, like, say, a far-right government, they always go after the arts. Mm. And I think because it kind of really, art engenders empathy. And I think when you're more empathetic, you're less likely to kind of vote terrible ways or kind of have really crap politics or kind of... Well, so it's, it is really interesting. In terms of like myself personally, like, honestly, I, I think like many people, I was just tired of complaining. And mm. I think it got to a point where I was like, I couldn't keep on asking the wrong people to do the right thing. So I was like, well, okay, well, what can I do? And I guess just through asking questions, 
one thing led to another, like who makes the local decision, how, how, how can you get things done, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And just for asking questions, learning things through YouTube, reading, bringing people together, and then it was like, okay, it's a local council, how did it, and then guy like stood and with the Green Party of the local council, and then one thing kind of led to another, but I guess from a personal perspective, it's always been how can I make myself most useful, kind mm -hmm. of thing. And even like, in a lot of kind of campaign work I do, I look to art as a mechanism, yeah. as creativity without using photography, whatever it is basically, just because I'm like, well, okay, this is how we do things. This is how it's always been done. Mm -hmm. How can I try and do things a bit different? And then I'm like, okay, I guess I use creativity as I weaponize it in some degree. Yeah, it's, that, that's, that, sorry, go on. No, that makes me think of, you know, we started our theatre company, Good Chance, in the Calais refugee and migrant camp, uh, the jungle, as it was called. Um, and, you know, that was right in the middle of the what was called the European refugee crisis. Lots of people were traveling across Europe and... and and into Europe, as well as, you know, across the Middle East and North Africa. And, you know, there were months and months of headlines, terrifying headlines, like all these, this hysteria in the press, this fear. But what changed was that photograph of Alan Kurdi. Mm. You know, it was, it was a, a photograph, it, it, not a piece of art, but something that, that broke through and connected yeah. to people in a, in a really different way. That the stories that the, you know, the speeches, the politicians couldn't, suddenly people could see it. They could connect to it. They could understand the, the 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 terrible human catastrophe that was happening, and and that in many ways inspired inspired us to to go. What can we do? We need to find mm. a way of doing something. But it, mm. you know that that was a huge part of that. You know, mm. do you know? Um, I come from a city called Sheffield in the UK, which is the first city of sanctuary. Mm. Basically, it was the first refugee settlement city in the UK. So it's got a very long, rich history of welcoming people. And the other day, I was actually speaking with a couple of asylum seekers and that came uh, to Sheffield. And they were all asking the question of, why do people care more about Ukrainian refugees mm -hmm. than they care about other refugees? And in some kind of degree, it's like, we are told, you can argue through the media, through the press, through politicians, who we should care about. You know, we should care about more about these people. You can see it in terms of the messaging and everything. Um, of course, we should be caring about everyone. People like people don't like had to flee their homes, and we should be treating them. But it's like, where can you see the role of art? There's nothing mm. like the mm. theatre, whatever. Of in terms of like equitably sharing that empathy, mm -hmm. kind of thing. Mm. It's it, it, you're you're completely right, and it's a genuine problem. And I mean that in the in the truest sense, it is a problem to be solved. Um, one one of the things that we did last year, um, we after what Joe described when we set up a, a theatre in a place called The Jungle, we wrote a play about um, that experience and we worked with lots of people who'd been in that theatre and had come to the UK to, to build that show and there was a character called Little Amal in it and she just had one line, she wanted, it was one word actually, she said school. Um, and, but for various reasons we thought that this character had a lot more to say um, and last year we, we staged well, we call it a production because it's, it's a piece of art. It was a moving festival type thing that began on the Turkish border and ended in Manchester. And just on that intersection between arts and politics, one of the most amazing things that happened throughout the journey was we met mayors, uh, politicians through every country that we went through. And these politicians would perform an act of welcome that they wish that they could perform or do or offer to a real person. So Amal... So you, should, you should mention the, the little Amal we created as a puppet. So, so a, a, a 12-foot high uh, puppet created by these amazing puppetry and movement artists. And it was her journey across 8,000 kilometers. I mean, without wanting to exaggerate, <laughs> if that's a real person, you know, Amal's here and that's the mayor. And there was a genuine conversation that happened here where the politician spoke to this puppet as if she was a real refugee. They shook her hands, they held her, the Pope met her and cried before her. And it's dispiriting in a sense, because why can't we treat a human being as we do a puppet mm. that represents a, a person in plight? But at the same time, that power of bringing politicians into a piece of art, into a, a false reality in a sense, was so, it felt really important to me. And I, as, we, as we go forward, I think, artists should be working with politicians mm. a lot more in that kind of way. Mm. 100%. And I guess one of the things, as an activist, 
as a form of policy, I used to ask myself is, how do we get from that point to actually creating yeah. change? Because yeah. a lot of it is performative. You'll get like politicians doing performative politics and just taking stuff for the picture or just feeling that they have to be there because everyone's yeah. kind of be there. Everyone's going to be there, but it's like, well, okay, it's amazing. We had this kind of great event. Everyone clearly cares. And like, yes, we could then talk about it at council chamber. Then what, like, like with, with the work that you do, is there going to be like, like impact in, yeah, in, yeah, impact yeah, in the sense yeah, yeah. of like you know how like some documentarians have like impact producers they'd be like <laughs> so be like, okay now we're going to like set maybe a petition they're gonna do it like, mm. we're not like mm. a lot of pressure i'm not expecting you to guys to solve the, like <laughs> refugee crisis whatever but in terms of like where like where do we in terms of with artists is it just a form of just creating the art which equally valid and then leave yeah, it yeah. Or, or do you think have do you have a sense of responsibility to go further, kind mm, of thing. Like, mm. I, why, like, have you thought of, like, maybe standing for office or, like, or, or do you kind of just think, no, our jobs as artists is simply to create the art and inspire others and let them, which is, of course, anything can happen. Yeah. I would never run for office. <laughs> I mean, I would never, I, I don't think I'd ever get to a point where I had confidence enough in my um, set of ideas um, to, to, to distribute them to a country. Um, mm. You're already uh, doing it. Well, in a sense, but I'm doing yeah, yeah. it. We're, we're doing it in, you know, in an artistic framework, mm. which, um, you know, at its heart is um, grappling with the problem of complexity of the world. Mm. And art, you know, when it's at its best, it, you know, there's, you're going to see a lot of plays at the moment in the West End. There's a really sort of jazzy um, trend to put a really big monologue at the end of a show that sort of tells the audience exactly what they need to take away from this. And they go, <laughs> so you, you watch this really complex drama of people going, oh, I quite like that. Oh, no, no, I disagree with that. Blah, 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 blah. And then at the end they go, hmm, and this is what you need to think about it. <laughs> Great. And you go, ah, that's, in a very deep sense, that's not true. And I think it's, it's partly a, a balance, I suppose, of, of, of knowing you do want to say something but also respecting that the audience have the ability to, to assess and engage with what you've presented to them. Mm. Mm. I think, of course, everyone can, like, everyone has got some degree of influence, got some capacity to do whatever it is within their kind of capacity, capacity they could do. But I guess in terms of, like, how do you guys, in terms of, like, making sure that, I guess, with the people, like, voices are represented or, like, just on the topic of climate, like, it's... Mm. We kind of know, even though is, we're talking a lot about the future in the, in, for the next two days, but a lot of it is happening right now, kind of thing. Like, yeah. if you look at what's happening in Pakistan with the floods happening in Somalia due to the mm -hmm. and, and droughts, it's like these countries are the least responsible for the climate crisis. They're the ones that are paying the most, the, the kind of most damage for it. So it's like how, I guess, as artists living in the West, living in Europe, can we kind of make get not even just like spreading awareness, but telling stories from yeah. different parts of the world. Yeah. What's I mean, that, that, that's the, the main focus, I think, of, of Good Chance going forward. Yeah. You know, as a company mm. that was founded in a refugee camp seven years ago, mm. we've worked with people from ref, refugee and migrant backgrounds around the world, amazing artists, people with really important things to say. And actually, you know, now we're looking to a future where that movement of people in 2015 will seem like a prologue to yeah. something, you know, immensely, immensely... Uh, more profound. You know, the, we were talking earlier about the IPCC report in March that said by 2030, which is not really the future, it's like tomorrow, you know, a quarter <laughs> of a billion years. people in Africa are Eight going to be years. under high water stress, and maybe 700 million will be have forced to have f fled their homes. So I think, you know, as artists, I think we feel that arts, civic society, the, the, the you know, those sort of you know, fungal things that connect people in their little, in their little groups, in their towns, in their cities, these invisible mm. threads that are being, you know, pulled with the arts cuts that you're talking mm. about. Actually, they have the power to, to really build resilience in our communities because I don't think anyone is talking about how the world is going to cope with that amount of movement and without falling into the, the right-wing traps of, of demonizing people on the move, of making people seem scary, of, you know, how, how, do, you, how do you walk that tightrope, you know? Mm. There's, there's, I, th I think that's so, that's so interesting. Um, I think, I've, you know, the world that I sense, and, and I'm sure everyone in this room you know, has, has read the predictions of, it feels 
to me like an incredibly fluid world that we're about to enter where, I mean, I, you know, I don't know what a, a country will feel like in 30 years time um, or whether that idea itself will be outmoded um, and impossible. But I talked a little bit about the, the atmosphere that, and the feeling that art creates and engenders in people. Um, if we are to enter a, a world in which movement is, let's say, constant, that means that we'll be having relationships that are shorter, we'll be meeting more people, and our disposition, our way of engaging with people will have to be different. Mm. It will have to be generous, it will have to be open, um, it, won't have to be, it, it can't be dependent on what you think and your ego, mm. because... Mm. Anyway. Yeah. I mean, it, and to take that further, and I know we're supposed to be inspirational, I think that's <laughs> one of the things, inspirational at these events, but like... I think we're entering a period of, of massive global destabilization that we have not experienced at all, certainly not in the global north. I mean, the, the, you know, since what's happened in Ukraine, the, the, the Russian invasion, the, the, you know, the need for energy independence, for food independence, is gonna, is gonna slam right against all our efforts to get to net zero. And you know, all of that together means, I think artists need to actually stand up and, and take hold of these things, to be bold, to intervene in places, to... I think we're very good at asking whether we have the right, whether we should, how, what will be the... I think, actually, we've got to... We, I think we've got to um, but do you know, get ready. How do you balance... Because there's... Many people would argue, I guess, when it comes to climate, that a lot of the messaging communication is very doom and gloom, very dystopian. Yeah. Kind of, of course, the facts we need to kind of let people know the truth, but at the same time, like... Hope, being hopeful and trying to paint a better picture of what can be rather than being in a state of despair has been proven with, with a political campaign in any sort of campaign or get your message in terms of mobilizing people yeah. so how do you I guess try and balance the fact of getting the harsh realities of what could happen while at the same time trying to be hopeful and trying to paint mm. that picture mm. of what can I, be I just, that I think relate, my answer is going to relate to a point that Brian made I think um, about actually what we are at the moment. And, and one, one of the things that we've become quite interested in and we're, we're working on at the moment, we're writing a play about this, is, um, I mean, obviously there's been a load of work, a load of brilliant non-fiction and, 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 and some fiction in different forms about um, this movement, this climate movement, but we're working on a play at the moment that's, that's trying to... It's about the Kyoto Protocol in 1997. It's about the, the first time that the world agreed to reduce carbon emissions. And it's a story that contains 176 nations, and it's an absolute, I'm not gonna swear, but it's a mind boggler at the moment. Um, <laughs> sounds, but, it sounds like it could be very, a sort of multilateral uh, IPCC negotiation, sounds like it could be dry, but it's much more but, dramatic than you, than you imagine. But, but the point being, I think we, we need to historicize what we have already done yeah. to know where we're at. And we've made tremendous, tremendous gains. And, you know, that's what we're trying to do in this play. Um, I think that's what more of us need to do because that's essentially the, what you're talking about with communication. How do you get a higher definition picture of the problem before you? And, you know, as soon as we started researching what happened at Kyoto, you find amazing things like the formation of the alliance of small island states and the effect that that has on the global discourse. And, and suddenly you don't feel so alone when you, when you mm. sort of say what you honestly think. Mm. Guys, anyone got... Yeah, got on. Eve yeah. got a question. There's some <laughs> questions there as well, but... Um, colonization of my parents and grandparents' homeland. I'm relatively privileged now. Um, I think honesty is really inspirational for those of us who have a massive responsibility. I think solidarity with the most marginalized and making sure we repeat it is really inspirational. Mm -hmm. I don't think that in the UK particularly we can be too blasé about like how we're all, like I'm, I'm I hope we're all on the same side. I really do. Mm. But if you're talking about 700 million people being displaced, I'm not sure the UK is going to be the city of sanctuary that Sheffield was. Mm. I think we're doing everything we possibly can to repeat 
uh, the ills of the past that created um, the global south and my parents and my grandparents' homelands are now feeling the brunt of this. So I just wanted to say that I think it's incredibly uh, hopeful to be honest with groups of people who should be able to take that honesty, that should be able to rewrite a narrative that isn't just furthering um, the colonization of our minds and telling a happy story, which should then make us act and should make us embody that in creative, artistic, participatory ways in our streets, homes, neighborhoods, in government, wherever we go back to. But I do think it's really important um, at this stage where we still have a chance to do something really radical that we have to hear it and so i don't find it doom and gloom mm. that a room like this should hear it and that we should say it loudly and that we should not um hide away from eco-fascism and what we know is coming and what we already know is happening in in our country particularly that doesn't mean i think it should destabilize us to doing nothing yeah. um or that you know uh, we have to share complex stories but i just want to say that i think it's incredibly hopeful and if rooms like us can't handle it we've got a real problem mm. and it's our job to figure out what we do with that and how we show up in the world we definitely shouldn't be pretending like it doesn't exist because we're not talking about a story that was thousands of years ago we're talking in places like where i come from one generation away most of us have stories of the impact of colonization on our homelands on our ancestors, on our resources, and are now witnessing around us a hostile environment, an environment that makes us feel unsafe. And this is all, in, they're interlinked stories of justice. 100%. Um, and I don't think they stop us from building bold, inspirational, hopeful, amazing things that are for everyone. Mm. But I don't think we should pretend that is not true. So I just wanna say, I think I find you incredibly hopeful and I'm really grateful for the creative, playful way you've talked about that. Oh. Yeah. I, I, I think that's a fantastic point. I love yeah. the way you express that and, you know, decolonizing our minds and decolonizing yeah. narratives. We, we talk a lot about reclaiming individual and collective narratives, you know, of, 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 of actually going, you know, the world is just a, a, you know, tornadoes of stories and actually they're up against each other and unless you reclaim them, give, you know, you talk about the alliance of small island states, you know, little coral atolls like Kiribati that for whom climate change is not next year or in a hundred years, actually they are going through the process of dismantling their cultures, their language, their history, their relationship with the land and moving it to one of the higher, higher islands. And, you know, actually those, we've got to find a way of, of putting those stories, dragging those stories to be told by the people experiencing that and putting them on our biggest stages, whether it's the West End or on Broadway, on TV, on film, like, like that's how you reclaim narratives. That's how you tell those stories. Yeah. I, I think what I loved about what you said there was, uh, and I've, I've sort of wrestled with this myself for, for the last seven years because we say that we, we're a theatre of hope. And, and sometimes I, I really love that and I think, oh, we're doing exactly the right thing and we're hopeful and we're right. Um, but sometimes I feel like it's, it's a little bit fluffy and it's a little bit sort of it's like... It's the word hopium, people seem to say, <laughs> hopium. <laughs> very good, um. very good. Um, but I, and I, so I suppose it's... It's somewhere in between those two things. There is, there is a sort of, um, not a dismissal of reality with hope, but part of hope is being able to imagine beyond what is the case at the moment. But I suppose there is, a, there is also an assertiveness to hope that you want to achieve what you view the future should be. It can be radical. And it can be radical. Yeah. Um, so I, I suppose in the end, like, do we try and find a place between that assertiveness and that fluffiness isn't the right word, I'll have to find a better word, we can talk about it later, but you understand my point, maybe. Just, I guess, just coming off of that, how can, like, what, how can artists use their privilege to basically give voices, spaces to other people, whether that be other artists, or other kind of, like, for mm. example, you guys in the world of theatre and play and stuff, how do you, like, if you were going to tell stories of something that was happening, how would you kind of ensure that it was being done in a just way, kind of? Because, of course, as artists, artists come with their own kind of ideas and mm -hmm. they're all what they want, want, want to do, but how do we kind of make sure that we're doing justice by it, basically? And it's not this... I know a lot of people kind of like it. It's, it's not just kind of just washing away, being like, mm -hmm. yeah, we're just doing it for the sake of doing it, but yeah. mm -hmm. how do we kind of ensure that we are kind of using our privilege to... Well, I mean, I'll, I'll just 
Oh, no, you want to go? No, you go. You go. Well, I, I mean, I know I just talked about the West End and Broadway, but I think one of the first things you do is you drag, out, drag art out of those buildings, and, you know, you, you, they're, they're ridiculously expensive to run. They're, they're, like, really inefficient, and actually art shouldn't be housed in this sort of... Cl Sometimes it should, and that's, that's really important, but art, get it into the streets, get it into communities. That's what, you know, walking a puppet across Europe and her meeting people in council estates and Vatican Square is as, is as good an art I've ever seen as, as, mm. as a player or an opera. Um, and, I, and then I think, make sure that the people telling the stories are, you know, it, that, so another, another version of our puppet, the, the, other, the other week we did an event called Fly With Me, which took the amazing tradition of Afghan kite flying, and on the one year anniversary of the fall of Afghanistan to the Taliban, in, 20, in 46 locations all around the world, people from the Afghan di diaspora in all of those places came together in town squares, on beaches, uh, you know, on cliff faces, and flew <laughs> Afghan kites, which they'd been working with the local communities to make over the months before, and they had a day of Afghan music, Afghan food, Afghan kite flying, and everyone was welcome. People Great from day out. all different places, it's and really it happened in 50 out. places across the world. And actually, the, the important th that was art. It was flying a kite, but gosh, it was, it was about so much more than, than just that simple act. It was, it was the art form, it was the national sport, it was kites as a means of communication, as a means yeah. of holding on to heritage, to history, to language, to culture. And, you know, the important thing about that was we hired 30 amazing people from, from an Afghan background around the UK to run those events. They produced it. it they led the, the public narrative. They did all the interviews. It was completely their event. And I think that, that's an important model for us going forward, is that's how to do it. That's the only way to do and, it. And some of those Afghan producers were, you know, speaking on... Chinese news about this. This was, in the end, this was seen by, I think, over a billion people. Like, just, just some Afghans saying what the importance of kite flying is in their country and how the fact that it's been banned now again by the Taliban is incredibly significant. Yeah. And, and to dig into that and go, why, why is that? And what does that say about this regime? And it's, yeah, I mean, it was, it and was it an extraordinary the day. conversation in a way that, you know, an, an article about, you know, the, 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 the terrible humanitarian crisis happening there right now, which, you know, a lot of people, the fatigue they feel when they watch the news, but suddenly there's this gateway that allows you to talk about that in a way that you can, you can just feel it like a kite in your hands. I don't know. I, you, you, it was so interesting. We did this um, preparation day because I, I couldn't make a kite before it, obviously. So <laughs> we had to get taught and we learned together how to make Afghan kites. And as soon as they go up in the sky, you, we sort of realised what this project was going to be. It's essentially, the kites are a distraction, they're the MacGuffin, it's actually conversations. So the kites go up, they're flying in the air, and I'm sort of trying to do this, and I'm with um, Hadisa from Afghanistan, and I'm having a conversation with Hadisa about when she was nine years old, the last time that she flew a kite in Afghanistan, she's describing where she lived, where she grew up, she's describing the politics, she's describing particularly important memories, and suddenly... I'm a white British guy who can actually begin to understand a different country that is very, very different from ours. And it was, it was a wonderful thing. It was beautiful. Yeah. I think the, other, the only other thing that I would add to that is, you know, for example, on a production like The Jungle that we, that we did, um, it was so important that, that in that cast, I mean, I think we had between... I think 15 nationalities um, represented within that company. Um, and there were four people who, were, who would literally come from the jungle. And they were in that show. And they created with us that show. And, you know, we talked at the beginning about perspectives. Like, you can't fake a perspective. Like, you can, you can sort of pretend. But, like, you have to have somebody who is from somewhere else with a different set of experiences if you're going to expand your perspectives. And, and I, I suppose that's mm. what we try and do as often as the story requires it. Mm. Mm. And I guess with so many things, you know, I guess within climate, but in general, so many injustices, how do you decide what stories to tell? <laughs> well, well, that's what Tim was, and uh, yeah, that's, 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 that's important. I don't know. I don't know. We'd, do you know that, that that project came from a board member of ours, uh, uh, also called Majid, actually, who is an <laughs> Iranian fine artist who we met in the jungle seven years ago, and he, he, started, he, 
he started painting again after we met him, and, and he's now this incredible graphic designer, he's an animator, he's a brilliant artist, and, and he's now on the board of the company, so he's our boss. <laughs> and he came to us last year and said, I've got lots of Afghan friends and filmmakers who, and this was during the evacuation from Kabul airport, mm. and he said, there are lots of artists under threat in that country at the moment, there are a lot of journalists under threat. So we worked with people who were get involved in exfiltration of people particularly at risk, and that, it was that one email from him that, yeah. that me meant we met all these other people that, that rolled over a year later into that event. Mm. So actually, it's a really human, there's no sort of committee meeting where we go, um, <laughs> you, know, what's, you know, which quadrant should we... <laughs> that just came from, from the people that we work with and the people that we know. But you're asking all the questions. Yeah, yeah, I, wanna, yeah. like, <laughs> I, I was going to ask about... I mean, I was, when, we were, when Kathy said, think about questions, you know... We think about this a lot as a company that's worked all around Europe. You know, you mm. were an MEP until Brexit, and mm. you know how how can art or politics? How how do we stop the UK drifting ever more into the obscurity of the Atlantic Ocean? How how can we build? <laughs> how can you know what I mean? How do Jeez. we how do we build bridges? How do we build new bridges that that go beyond those political ones that we've lost? And obviously, events like this are really important. But wow. yeah, big question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's like it's it's not like it's not like we're gonna like we're not gonna float away. But I think it's also really important to kind of highlight issues like air pollution. All these they haven't they don't see any borders mm. kind of thing. So we're still having to work collectively together. So it's like yes, logistically there might be a bit of paperwork, some difficulties with it. But especially I think everything a lot of things has moved online. But at the same time, I think. Honestly, I, I don't think you can destroy art. I don't think there's not um, any legislation or any Brexit, anything that can really just like kind of get in the way will fully destroy people coming together and working together. And so, so like, yes, to a certain degree, politicians have got a role to play kind of thing. And I think it is incumbent upon politicians. Like, when I say politicians, I don't necessarily even mean big MEPs or like MPs, even like local councils, anyone who's and considering themselves active activists or doing any sort of community work to kind of really use art and kind of value, value it and just to be able to show, well, no, listen, it's, we need to kind of uphold it and support it as best mm. as possible. Mm. And in terms of Britain's future, honestly, it's, it's hard to have hope yeah. in terms of British politics, to be quite honest with you. Even in, like, in, in terms of like the whole um, and our, our government and the whole... We all had a Rwanda policy. And actually, mm. when I was coming on the way here, somebody was telling me, like, imagine, like, isn't it great, like, you've got the most diverse cabinets... In, 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 in British, like you've ever had in British politics, and I'm like, and I'm like, and she, like this person was seeing that as a massive win, and as if like this, this cabinet would then therefore speak for everyone will have this amazing mm. fair society, not realizing that just having black and brown faces in high places isn't going to solve our problem. It's all this trickle down identity politics isn't really going to solve any of our issues, but it's honestly nothing more than social justice in every aspect of it. Is, is basically going to uh, help us. But it's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, basically. And I, I know we do look to artists as a way. Um, so, yeah, no pressure, basically. <laughs> yeah. I know we've got 10 minutes after that. We've got one question here. <laughs> I wanted to ask about um, telly, TV. And just in particular, almost, whether TV is one of the art forms that... Um, <laughs> can bridge some of these divides you're talking about because politicians care about what's popular on TV. Mm. It sort of breaks through in a particular way. And so I wondered sort of from your, but it's a question to all of you, sort of from your side, Majid, whether you think if the kind of stories that the Joes are telling in their current art forms were actually being seen on TV, do you think it would break through politically in a different way? And then also you both as writers, as playwrights and artists, do you, do you, think about TV, do you sort of care about it, do you think, because what, what I really feel is that the stories that you are so incredible at telling and helping other people tell as well, tell their own stories, that's not on TV. Mm. Those stories haven't made it onto TV at all. Just like m most issues connected with climate have still not made it onto TV. There's a really interesting initiative just started in the UK called Climate Spring, which is a bunch of foundations that have got together to work out how to finance um, bringing climate and mm. climate justice issues in particular into mainstream TV and film commissioning. But I just wonder, do mm. you 
do you just look away from it because it doesn't interest you or does it interest you? And then what do you feel, Majid? Would you? Do you know, it is really, really important. Like it's, I think broadcasters have got a big role to play in it as well. I, know, I don't know if you guys come across uh, Doc Society, who've got a climate lab who are also basically doing the same work of trying to push broadcasters and TV production companies in terms of funding more climate related and basic TV, whether that be documentary, whether that be TV series, even comedy, because it doesn't necessarily all have to be serious, kind of like hard hitting. It can come in all sorts of forms. But I think TV, the internet, well, I guess, yeah, mainly TV, but also just like everything moving to on d demand. When I say TV, I think more old school, like channel one, two, three, four, five, but you've got on demand television as well. So I think it has to be a way. I don't think it's something that we can kind of necessarily neglect. Mm. And it is something that everyone consumes are in some form, and a lot of it is watching things online, and I think politicians, everyone's consuming it, so with something like that has got such a big sway on p changing people's opinions and influence, we have to kind of make sure, not just that climate stories are being told, but different climate stories are being told, and how they're being told, but also who, who's telling the stories as well, so there's just so many different um, aspects to think about. Mm. I, I, th I think, um, I, I sometimes really struggle with watching TV, I feel, I feel it's a really, um, especially at the moment, I feel very passive when I watch television. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily because of the stories. I think it's partly the reality of, of, of sitting and watching a thing, which is, which is different to a theatre because you're, you're with bodies like we are now. And, um, you know, we're, you're stimulated and you may think differently. It's, it's, that's, that's a really important thing. But what I would say is that um, it will happen with TV because they're business people. Right. They, they, they will be very, very interested as soon as, um, you know, enough artists, and obviously we'll be some of them, um, uh, start clamouring to write these stories. And as soon as there is a um, uh, perceived to be a need from, from, a, from a big body of the demographic, um, it will happen. I think the challenge will be, how good can those things be? Like, can they be genuinely good stories, or are they going to be octopus teacher type things, which are wonderful, I but they... I love, I, 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 do, I love my octopus teacher. I shouldn't have used it as an example. I'm sorry. But you, you, you know, I mean, there, there's a... You do, what you don't want is, is, is just a baseline of stuff, and it to become, in a sense, a genre. Um, you want, I, I think, when I think about what environmental stories that um, that we could write that should perhaps be televised or mm. wouldn't it be amazing if they would it's the intersection with politics and and understanding the lobbies and all of these kind of things but, uh, oh sorry go on, sorry, go on. No, I was just gonna say I think we're really obsessed with um, documentaries at the moment yeah. and I, I wonder whether a part of that is because in this sort of post truth age of social media we the idea of a fiction, the idea of an artist creating a cat, like, it, like you know, we, we, we can only trust it if it's, you know, if it's clear, yeah, if it's yeah. factual. Yeah. And actually, I think you miss out on so much if you, like, my octopus teacher actually was a kind of middle ground between art and documentary, because it was true, but he was also telling a story that was, you know, he was talking about it as a relationship, as a, yeah. as a relationship of love, and, and all of those things sort of got into the arc, like, there was, the boundaries were blurred a little bit, but I think, you know, art should feel empowered to, to tell those stories. And I think just in the topic of TV, and it's, I think one thing, in my opinion, that we need to kind of get away from is just this constant sharing of the facts and, like, making mm. it very scientific and as much as I love Deep Planet and all, uh, but it's how, I, I just, kind of just think of that Maya Angelou quote where she goes, people don't necessarily remember what you say or do, but they remember how you make them feel. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, well, how do we then tell these stories, but in an engaging way that where it's engaging people on an emotional level? Mm -hmm. So that's what draws people, like you can throw, yeah. fa of course, facts and figures are all important, and they, they need to play a role, but that shouldn't be like, as if like, that will be the all, kind of, that'll solve itself out, but no. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, and also, oh, we've got four minutes. Yeah. I think, just going back to what you said about, I love TV, I'd love to write something really profound with TV, but the, being in a room together, getting rid of that atomization, the isolation, smashing people together so we can smell and, mm. you know, feel each other's body heat, which we, ha you, know, you know, we had two years without, and I think actually that, that, that is a, you know, that, that's where you have the real feelings, and that's where I think... I think it remains the case that physical reality is the best platform that we have, that's my <laughs> opinion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. You have to project. <laughs> <laughs> it's on. 
it is it is honest my voice my yes, voice is I'm, just feeling yeah. <laughs> i was for for three years i was on the welcome trust in, in england and and it was disastrously middle class yeah and then i did I, I'd been asked to do two things with the trust. The first thing was to do something they'd never done before. So I got them all rat ass together. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when they were drunk, when they were drunk, I asked them why, why did we hire really good people to then listen to really crap ideas from other people to give money to? So why didn't we just do something else and ask some of the people who actually worked for the Wellcome mm. Trust to do something? Anyway, this guy came up with a game that became the most popular game in the world, a computer game in the world. I want to share this with you. Yeah. Right? It, the brief was, we want you to teach medicine to the widest possible audience. And you'll never guess what they did. They came up with a game called Virus. <laughs> and your job is to kill the whole world. And if you manage to kill the whole world, there was a really big prize. And people just went mad for this game. Now, I just wonder whether maybe you, you're completely wrong. Your whole theatrical <laughs> direction is wrong. You should now become the Squid Game version of, you know, Save the Planet. I just wanted to put that by you, that maybe you'd become too soft. Yeah. <laughs> Oh God! Love please it. hope you're wrong. I mean, yeah, maybe we're, maybe we're on the wrong track. I don't know. <laughs> I guess you're on the right track for now. Of course, things can happen in the future, kind of thing. I think it's just I don't know, just doing what you can now. And I don't know, maybe you will move on to TV. Maybe you yeah, will kind of use yeah. different mediums because I, cause I guess as artists, you're never just one thing. I don't think you guys would ever should have or just even good chance of it should be yeah. like. Yes, this is the only thing that we're ever going to do, kind mm. of thing, and I think... Mm. But think those big going. streaming services, like, they don't make money. They're, they're, they're just a massive bubble of, of investment, it's and, you know, that's not going to... You know, ha what, what is beyond those things? What, what is beyond that, that place where we're watching this? Do you know, for example, Little Amal, fantastic mm. in the sense of... It's not in a theatre room. You don't have to go and buy tickets forever. It is engaging with God knows how many people, mm. kind of thing. Is that a model you can just replicate on? So like how many times can you do that mm. on a large scale? Or do you have to start looking into tech mm. and basically like doing theatre, whatever it is on tech and model, just to be able to engage more people mm. and try and... Well, this, I, I suppose, what, question, yeah, that is yeah. a properly good question because, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't do a mall every single year because the, you know... We'll get tired, the, he, she, she, get she, tired. She, she herself will get very <laughs> tired, of course. But um, the, the transgression of her stepping into someone's street or park or whatever it is would I, I suspect but it's guess would would lose some weight over over time um but i think that that that's a great thing for an artist because it just means that you can't do this the same trick mm. again and again you you need to think of different ways of of yeah. of, of yeah. stimulating people and provoking people into uh, to seeing what what you're seeing of the world yeah and also, you know, we talk about biodiversity in those great, there are great sessions earlier. I think utilize, just to, you know, talk about tech, to talk about video games, <laughs> utilizing all this ecosystem, you know, they're all tools of communication. They're all tools for telling stories. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, giving people, feel, giving people the boldness to be able to intervene in those forms and go, yeah, I'm going to tell this story. I'm going to fight for these stories to be told, whether it's with Netflix or, or you know, in a town square. I think, you know, that, that's the, we've got to pick up the mantle now, I think, artists, and, and stop apologizing, stop trying to find ways of justifying it through education, which is important, but there's also, there's something more radical there. There's something more important. The, 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 sorry, can I just say one more thing? Um, it was, it was something that, that you guys were saying, which is that, that we all have a place in this. There's an ecology within our movement. And if, if, if we know our play, I mean, we're, we're playwrights. We think we can do that pretty well. If we can keep doing that, that's a good thing to do. If we know our roles and really expend our energy into them, I suspect that we've got enough strength to do this. Mm. And that's, I suppose, my pitch, rather than diluting and going TV from... I don't Are you know. going to end on a hopeful note? Yeah, yeah. maybe. <laughs> yeah. It was a pretty good note. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Majid, any last words? Honestly, I think you guys are doing an amazing job. And I think the role of art is important now more than ever. So, yeah. Thanks, more power to art. Well, like, more well, power to art. And this is a conversation that will very much continue. Thank you so much. 
grab people over a drink. I hope you're sticking around now. Um, you will.